friend of mine uh, recently wrote me an email saying, I have been severely depressed for 25 years. It's hard to imagine. And I've known you know, the person for about 15 to 20. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, it, you know, uh, depression and how practice could help that. Could you go a little deeper into that? Um, because if you accept and don't fear depression and it's still there, it's a pretty bad place to be. And the same thing would be with a physical illness. I'm sorry, Thank what you. do you mean by physical? What do you mean the oh, same like, thing with the physical? Uh, like I have chronic pain, for instance, but I'm more interested in what you have to say about depression because it relates directly to a state of mind. Mm -hmm. So that's a really technical question because I know that you know, there's different kinds of depression. And um, I don't really want to talk about it too much because, first of all, because I'm not a qualified psychologist. Um, and I know that there, there are certain kinds of depression that meditation actually doesn't help. Doesn't help. Um, and I don't understand because I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not a psychologist. I don't understand the technical reasons for it, but there may be ways in which depression actually is not helpful, is count contraindicated for depression. There are other types of depression where uh, the ability to actually be with what is difficult might be helpful because a lot of the time, sometimes, not, not a lot, but sometimes depression comes from being unable to bear uh, certain things in, in life. And meditation pointing you to a way of working with, gently working with what is true, whether it's easy to bear or difficult to bear. I've certainly seen it in uh, practice with many students that when they're able to turn to what is difficult, that uh, the, the uh, I, don't want to, I don't really want to talk about it as depression because it's a technical word, but certainly the difficulty that they were experiencing in having, um, in, in working with difficult situations and dif difficult moods of, of the mind are able to lift. So um, I... If, if there is somebody that you really want to talk to about working with meditation, I would make sure that um, whoever they're working with professionally really weighs in on what might be helpful and what might not be helpful. Wow. <laughs> Sorry unpleasant, about that. Unpleasant, <laughs> unpleasant, unpleasant. <laughs> I, I would like to just follow up on that. And first of all, thank you so much for tonight's teaching because it was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, but to follow up on that, and I stumbled into this whole practice when I fell into a book in the library called The Mindful Way Through Depression. Mindful. The Way Through Depression. Mindful way through depression. Yeah, yeah. and um, that was a couple years ago. But I would say that the, the sitting practice that I've developed maybe over the last eight months, nine months, ten months, I can't explain it, but there is an incredible shift. Um, Beautiful. That, That's great. I, you know, and, and I really appreciate that you know, professionally there, some depressions really need a different kind of modality. But for anybody who's wondering whether this works, uh, it certainly can. <laughs> so I just well, and we, but we, ha you know, we have to be careful about talking about what works. Yeah. Well, I know, not really works, but yeah. Be and but because what works really is complete freedom. Mm. That's what I'm interested in for everybody here, for everybody in the world, is complete freedom. However, we get to it, uh, you know. So. Buddhist meditation is not the only way to it. I understand. Um, but uh, there, 
what's helpful, I think, is to work with where am I suffering and how can I shift my relationship to those places of suffering. And the way we shift our relationship really is by turning to them. And I think a lot of, I, I have a friend who teaches um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is, the studies have shown, are really excellent for depression. And I should have mentioned that to you, so that might be a way of working with your friend. Um, but frankly, I'm, I'm really interested in your complete freedom. So that depression may be just one symptom of your lack of freedom. And I don't want to minimize it because I know there's a lot of suffering in it. Um, and yet there's, you know, so it's beautiful that there's a stabilizing of it. And now see if there's a deeper way, a deeper place that you can get to, which would be really beautiful for you. But that kind of leads to my question, where, which is the translation into the habitual, the, 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 pa the habits that are much stronger than the meditation practice. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, that's true. In the be because it's like um, when we develop habits, what I see when, whenever I think about this for myself or, or for my students, it, the habits, the karmic wave is huge. There's a beautiful um, woodblock, Japanese woodblock, from an artist named Hakusai. That's iconic, actually. We've all seen it. it look, it's, like, it's a picture of a wave, but it's a woodblock. And I see that wave as like representing the, uh, the karmic wave of our habits. So we build this humongous wave. And then when we come in with meditation, it feels really small. It feels like, you know, just a, a, a tiny little, uh, you know, touching of the, the shore. But what happens eventually is that as we, as we meditate regularly and as our practice becomes deeper and deeper, it begins to have an effect. And it's like, if you look at um, river stones, River stones started out as huge rocks, and the water actually wore it down. Now, if you look at water and you look at a stone, you say, never. It could never happen. The water is much too soft for such a hard material. And yet, over time, that water, with patience and determination and perseverance and effort, just keeps doing what it does. And meditation is like that, is that as we, every time we sit down, we're actually um, saying to our habits, I can change. Things can change. These habits are not permanent, just like everything else isn't permanent. And so the ability of meditation to meet those habits becomes more and more strong, becomes stronger and stronger. Every time you sit down, the mind, the neuroscientists are telling us, are confirming now what the Buddha said. And what he said was, wherever we put the mind, that's where it will incline. And the neuroscientists didn't, aren't saying it, they're not using that language, but they're essentially saying we, wear new, we can wear neural pathways into the brain. So each time the, the, the brain goes towards a habit, and we move it away, a new, a new pathway gets built. So at, in the beginning, it feels like, oh my God, this is impossible. And yet, as we practice, we begin to see changes. And uh, what I like to tell my students is don't look at anything for a year. And then after a year, just start to notice how you respond in particular situations that you're familiar with. And invariably, they tell me, and I've seen it in myself, that suddenly, it seems like suddenly, something shifts. And the very same situation is responded to in a different way. But, and it, 
in the beginning, it feels uh, difficult to connect the two, like sitting down in meditation and how we are in life. But eventually, you'll begin to see that they marry each other and that there, there is an effect, there is a definite effect that happens in the mind. Thank you. That's very encouraging. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Hi. Back here. Over here. Hi. Um, I don't know that much about Buddhism. Uh, I just want to ask, do Buddhists believe that God has a personality or do you believe in like a non-personal uh, deity? A non-personal what? Deity. Uh, Buddhism is a non-theistic... Um, a non-what? It's non-theistic. So Buddhists don't believe in God? There is no God. Is um, in Buddhism. So you're, so you're telling me all Buddhists are atheists? Well, you know, what the Buddha said about God, or an original cause, is that he would never talk about it. And why would he never talk about it? Because he said your head would explode if you tried to figure out an original cause, a first cause. So it's not that, uh, to, to say it's atheistic has a kind of fabricated or constructed uh, expression about it. But to actually look and see what is true in your experience is what is always being pointed to. So if there is some part of you that experiences the mystery and you want to call that God, that's perfectly wonderful. But look at your own experience and really see what it is with that mystery. So that whatever uh, beliefs you want to adopt, you're adopting because it's your experience. If you have an experience of God and that's what you call it, that's beautiful. It's not a, it's not a question of belief or not belief, but a question of what is, what is true for you. And that's what we're constantly trying to find out is what is true in my experience, what is really true for me. And if, you, and if there is a personal God that you feel is helpful to you and is really there in your experience, go for it. Does that help? Um, <laughs> well, not really. Um, it's almost, I mean, from what you're saying, it's almost like everyone should decide for themselves. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, it's almost like what you're saying is everyone should decide for themselves. But yeah. do, I mean, do, in Buddhism, do they believe like, would you agree, say, a first source? How about that term? A first? A first source uh, of all reality. If, of all? The first, yeah, a first source of all reality. A for, first source of? <laughs> a, a first source and center, a cause of the universe. Oh, a, just, first, oh, a first cause yeah, of the universe. Yeah, something like that. I mean, well, as I said, to me that... But just say, like, you know, a god, but without personality, you know, like an all-pervasive force, a universal force. Mm -hmm. That's something that you agree with? If there's a universal force, is, there some, is that something I agree with? Yeah, like a source, a first I certain, source. I, I don't think about a for, first source because I think I can never solve it. Because it would never solve it? I can't solve it. Okay. I don't want my head to explode. <laughs> So, just one last question. Just to follow up, um, I hope you don't mind on, on that last question, because uh, this is something that my husband and I are trying to resolve in terms of figuring out where we are spiritually and, and what we want for our family. And, and rather than follow what's always been done in our family, figure out what's true for us and where we feel comfortable. And so, so is it possible to, to, and we're very comfortable with, with the teachings of Buddha, but we also don't want to let go of the cultural and traditions that we come from. So is there, is it, it, it seems that it's possible to do both. 
is, and mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, what works for you in terms of living a good life of integrity and uh, wisdom is what, what is wished for you. Mm -hmm. So however that manifests and however that shows up in your life mm -hmm. and whatever feels as if that's what promotes freedom mm -hmm. in a way that you can walk the earth with kindness, with compassion, with wisdom, and with poise. That's what, and do absolutely no harm to any living thing. Whatever works to do that for you, please. That's what works. You. And you know, what the Buddha essentially taught is that whatever teachings we hear, we put them into effect in our own lives. And if they have a wholesome effect, then that's what we should go with. If they have an unwholesome effect, that's what we should let go of. It's pretty simple stuff. So thank you all for your attention and for being here. I really appreciate it. And I just want to express deep respects to Atara and thanks for inviting me. Right, thank you, Gina.